Hello, hello everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to you this evening. Uh, I'm Diane Coyle. It's my great pleasure to be chairing this year's Chief Executive's Lecture, which is always a, a tremendous highlight. Could we start with the housekeeping? Please turn your phones to silent. Um, we're filming the evening. There's going to be some live subtitling by stage text as well. We're streaming live over the web. So a hello to everybody who's joining us online at the moment as well. And anybody who wants to get involved in the discussion, the Twitter hashtag is RSA Economy. So as that suggests, the focus tonight is the economy, which delights me because I'm an economist. And it's particularly topical because tomorrow is budget day, of course. But it's also an opportunity for the RSA tonight to open up a richer conversation, national, international, about the kind of economy that we actually want. And in his speech uh, tonight, Matthew is going to present some ideas that are going to guide the RSA's programme of research in this area um, in economy, enterprise and manufacturing over the coming months. And uh, he'll be inviting us all to take part in that work, join in the discussion and help shape the kind of new thinking that so many of, many of us say that we want to become active participants in a fairer and freer kind of, um, kind of economy. So without any further ado, please welcome the RSA Chief Executive Matthew Taylor for his 2015 lecture the human welfare economy. Uh, thank you, Dan, and I'm incredibly grateful and somewhat daunted that you're responding to uh, or chairing this event. Um, so I I'm going to dedicate my lecture to um, Anita and John. Now, you don't know who Anita and John are, so I should explain. I went to their wedding this weekend in Italy. And at 5 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, I woke up and decided I had a better way of writing my speech. So instead of spending the whole of Saturday by the pool on the beach, <laughs> mixing with the other wedding guests, I was in my bedroom rewriting the speech. So I didn't really mix with people very much, and I didn't really mix them on Sunday morning because I was still writing it. And as I got ready to leave and rushed downstairs, the taxis were arriving, and I kind of felt I ought to say something because I'd been so rude. So I went up to them and I said, thank you so much for uh, letting me come. Um, and I said, look, I, I, the least I can do, I said, is I, what I'd like to do, because I haven't really spent much time with anybody else, is I'd like to dedicate my annual lecture to you and to your wedding. Never has the phrase, it's better to give than to receive, been more... Uh, <laughs> Completely true, really, I have to say, from the look uh, in their eyes. I think they would have preferred a toaster, to be honest. Um, so, uh, the RSA strategy commits us to work uh, in three areas. Uh, public services and communities is one. Uh, learning and development is the second. The third is economy, enterprise, and manufacturing. Underlying all our work is what we call the power to create, which is the RSA's perspective on how the world is, and how it should be. Now, our projects reflect our worldview. Our work on public services seeks to enhance what we call social productivity. That's the degree to which public services enhance the capacity of individuals and communities to contributing to meeting their own needs. Our work on learning is based on the value of creative capacities as something to instill in learners and as a characteristic of successful educational systems and institutions. And our economy strand, in our economy strand, our great recovery project uses design perspectives to explore the scope for less wasteful, more circular forms of production. We work with maker spaces to exploit the potential of technology to enable new forms of craft, small scale manufacturing. And our business research has challenged negative views of growing self-employment, showing how people prize the greater autonomy of being their own boss. So as Diane said, we intend to expand our economic work but, but as we do so, we need to develop an account of what a good economy, a power to create economy, would comprise. And this, my eighth, yes, it has been that long, my eighth annual lecture is a contribution to that task. In this speech, I suggest a framework for a resilient human welfare economy based on the following five design principles. Such an economy would have clarity of mission and purpose. It would be efficient and sustainable in its use of assets. It would be effective and strategic in the application of key policy instruments. It would empower individual citizens as economic actors, and it would be participative and democratic in its economic institutions. On the basis of these principles, I also identify a set of policies, many of which the RSA will be advocating in coming months. 
So tomorrow, George Osborne will tell us how well our national economy is doing. And we are all, no doubt, relieved not to be in the terrible plight of Greece. Indeed, on conventional measures, we are doing better than most, if not the rest of Europe. But the question is this, have we as a country agreed, have we even properly debated what a successful economy means? Last week, with the support of Prince Charles, Cambridge University's Institute for Sustainable Leadership published a list of tasks to be undertaken by government and business in pursuit of sustainability, ranging from taxing environmental harms to creating new financial structures. And there has indeed been much important work on alternative economic models and indicators. But the fact is, that on the whole, this work has only rarely broken through into mainstream policy debate or public consciousness. Why not? Well, over the last 20 years, economic policy has been largely framed by two contrasting narratives. Between the mid-90s and 2008, the story was that economic growth, portrayed as permanent, end to boom and bust, I'm sure you remember that, that economic growth would enable us in time to solve all problems. Now, towards the end of that period, there was some questioning of that orthodoxy. There was the Sarkozy Commission on Alternatives to GDP. David Cameron became an enthusiast for well-being. And that added to a more established environmentalist critique of growth. But just as the growth solves all problems discourse was starting to be seriously questioned, we had the credit crunch. The economy of 1995 to 2008 was portrayed as bountiful. The economy of 2008 onwards, vengeful and fickle. We didn't need to question the first and we couldn't afford to question the second. The narrowness of this debate has been reinforced by the way we, the public, tend to think about economics as a technical discipline which only those with specialist knowledge can engage. In an earlier version of this speech, uh, I apologised for not being an economist. But have you ever heard anyone with opinions about society apologise for not being a sociologist? Portraying economics as a science, even in the face of its many failures of prediction, disguises the importance of history, culture, values in economic ideas. Whether it's international competitiveness, shareholder value, or GDP itself, as Diane showed in her recent book, mainstream economic discourse is full of complex, sometimes ideologically freighted ideas masquerading as purely technical descriptions of reality. But do we today have an opportunity to think and act differently? The most interesting branches of modern economics, behavioural, environmental, institutional, are far from the trite neoliberal nostrums relied upon by some commentators and politicians. In the wake of the credit crunch, free market ideology has fewer adherents and more critics. They'd include not just radicals and idealists, but corporate leaders and central bankers. And while our national economy is doing well in conventional and comparative terms, it has deep-seated characteristics that are far from benign the millions of people struggling to get by, the scale of inequality, the disjunction between economic rewards and public value, the sluggishness of productivity, the unsustainability of our patterns of consumption. This gap between top-line success and underlying problems highlights two aspects of misalignment. On the one hand, between economic progress and human welfare, and on the other, between short-term growth and long-term economic resilience. This evening, I'll outline a distinctive RSA method for opening up a wider, more progressive, but also policy-rich debate about how to create a resilient economy which enhances human welfare over the long term. In this task, I've drawn on the insights of economists and even some philosophers, but I've also been influenced by the RSA's commitment to design thinking. This was the idea that occurred to me at 5 o'clock in the morning in a hotel near Pisa. Steve Jobs once said, some people think design means how it looks. But of course, if you dig deeper, it's really how it works. In relation to economic policy, acting like a designer means combining a set of values with broad but adaptable assumptions, what I'm calling design principles, about how effective systems work. We live in tempestuous times. Individual policies can quickly fail in the face of complexity and volatility. Design principles provide us with a longer-term framework, demanding greater consistency, enabling greater accountability, helping to ensure that the means to economic reform remain grounded in the ultimate ends of that reform. The first design principle I want to suggest for a resilient human welfare economy is clarity of mission and purpose. Nietzsche described lack of purpose as the most common form of human stupidity. 
But if growth is a means to an end and not the end in itself, what are the human goals we want economic management to help us achieve? The answer for the RSA lies in our worldview, the power to create. The power to create prizes greater autonomy for all. Autonomy, as Enlightenment philosophers understood and as advances in behavioral science have underlined, is approach to the capacity for self-awareness, self-expression, personal development. As one of the most privately indebted countries in the world and one suffering from rising levels of obesity and mental illness, we can surely agree that we're not free if we merely follow our first impulses. And the RSA perspective differs from the main accounts on offer at the last general election by the Conservatives and Labour. It goes beyond an emphasis on economic growth and individual market freedom by posing more substantive questions about long-term human flourishing in a good society. And it differs from the traditional paternalistic, social democratic approach by believing justice is best served by creating the conditions in which people can take responsibility themselves for deciding what matters and what they value. And this perspective also goes beyond the concept of measurement of well-being, seen by many as the best way to balance GDP growth with a more human measure of progress. Well-being data is interesting, but what does it tell us about the foundations of the good society? Knowing how people feel about their lives today doesn't tell us how they might feel if different opportunities were within their grasp. Moreover, as the political scientist Will Davis and others have suggested, the well-being discourse has a tendency to cite the basis for human flourishing in the individual rather than the nature of our economy and society. A power to create economy would be one that enabled people, all people, to live what philosopher and political economist Roberto Unger has called the larger life, a life of greater depth, scope and intensity. And this, we believe, should be the ultimate goal of economic policy. So power to create is the RSA's way of defining what economic progress should comprise. What are the economic tools available in pursuit of this goal? The second design principle, my second design principle, is that the use of economic assets should be efficient and sustainable. But again, do we have even, a, even have a clear account of what our assets comprise? The reason some things are included and others not often feels arbitrary. Think of human capital. There's a big debate over whether immigration should be seen as something that enhances or diminishes our national resource base. The RSA has consistently taken the former view. But while we, would de while we debate numbers, we may lose sight of how immigration policy is negatively impacting a less tangible key asset, the global image of our university system. Education and skills are an important and contested dimension of human capital. Many commentators, including here at the RSA, believe the curriculum we're forcing school children to pursue is based on an outdated economic model, failing to teach students the skills and capabilities they really need to fully contribute to economic and social progress. Think of age. It's been argued that the decline in Japan's economy over the last two decades is almost entirely explicable in terms of population aging. Recent UK governments, mindful of voting patterns, have shoveled money at older people, but how can we think of an aging population as an asset, not just a drain? More widely, the emphasis on tackling the fiscal deficit, important though that goal is, tends to portray public service expenditure purely as a cost to the economy. But wise government spending can enhance our asset base and not just their infrastructure investment. It's noteworthy that President Obama's health reforms are having a benign effect on the wider US economy, enabling people to have greater flexibility in the jobs they take up, reducing the risks of setting up a business. And what about the assets which tend to be overlooked in economic debate? Global surveys find that the UK is seen as, an attractive, is seen as attractive in large part because of its heritage and cultural assets, an argument that was confirmed by the work of the recent Warwick Commission led by RSA Chairman Vicky Haywood. But that's not a fact you hear being taken terribly seriously by Treasury policymakers. International comparisons show that trust in people and institutions is correlated with economic dynamism. Now, we don't see high levels of political cynicism or low and falling levels of trust in strangers as economic factors but perhaps we should think again. And of course, there's the issue of natural assets and the environment. Here, the balance of short and long-term perspectives is critical. It's good news that 2014 was the first year ever when economic growth was not accompanied by an increase in global emissions, but this is the first step in a long, hard road. The debate over fossil fuel disinvestment is all about what we should count as an asset. So I doubt we could all agree what to include in a national register of economic assets. But unless we have some sense of our starting point, it's hard to assess either the overall success of our strategy or, crucially, the degree to which our actions are depleting or enhancing our asset base. 
So armed with an account of the human purposes of economic progress, attending to the question of what our assets might be, a third design principle for resilient, a resilient human welfare economy might be that its chief economic instruments are effective in aiming towards the mission and purpose we have set. And if that seems obvious, let's start with a particularly knotty issue for economic policy, tax. A characteristic of our current tax regime reflecting path dependency, electoral calculation, fear of major reform, is that as well as being very complicated, it isn't grounded in either an account of our ultimate goals or a set of consistent principles. For example, as the Resolution Foundation point out today, the total value of our complex and largely regressive system of tax reliefs in the UK now costs £100 billion a year, which is more than the whole system of working age welfare benefits. This design principle that economic policy instruments are directed to strategic goals would demand that an economy oriented to long-term human flourishing would tax things likely to detract from that goal, profiteering, intergenerational inequality, unsustainable consumption, while incentivizing behavior likely to contribute, employment, socially useful innovation, enterprise. And here are some examples of policies which might fit that design requirement better than our current arrangements. Land value tax is often portrayed as a cranky idea. Its implementation will be controversial, complex. But even though it's been around for centuries, the core idea is, if anything, more attractive today than ever before. In a world where inequality of wealth is even more concentrated, even harder to justify than inequality in income, such a tax not only tackles injustice, it helps stop what Thomas Piketty's, what, what, it helps stop in Thomas Piketty's powerful phrase, the past devouring the future. While taxes on consumption tend to reduce activity, taxes on work to reduce employment, a tax on land can't reduce the amount of land, indeed the reverse. It incentivizes the owners of land to put it to productive use, something that could help address our deepening housing supply crisis. Globalization e-commerce make it harder to levy taxes on profits and sales, as many corporations have realized. But land tax is almost impossible to avoid. You can't, after all, relocate your surplus land to Luxembourg or the Caymans. These and other qualities explain why a comprehensive land tax has been given support by economists from Milton Friedman to James Tobin, and why it's also recommended by those distinctly unflaky organizations, the OECD and the Institute of Fiscal Studies. Land tax is by definition spatial, so it could be used to increase the proportion of public finances raised locally. And another characteristic of a resilient 21st century economy might be, as the RSA has argued, that it would be industrially and geographically pluralistic. For example, devolving much more power to cities. So we might favor radical fiscal devolution, perhaps to a local income tax. And just as many cities have come to see their success is more dependent on cooperating with other places than competing with them, our national interest also lies in helping to design better features into the global economy. Can anyone doubt that in the long term we need a world where global corporations pay fair taxes and where countries compete on a level playing field? And given the absolute centrality of tackling climate change, Tax can surely play a more important and effective role in strengthening action to reduce carbon emissions in the rich world while helping poorer countries combine fast growth in their economies with slow growth in emissions. Now, you don't have to subscribe to neoliberal economic theory to recognize the brilliant way that markets combine billions of individual choices into dynamic systems. But still, the scope for everyone in our affluent society to be an independent economic actor is limited especially for those who start with the fewest advantages. The fourth design principle for a power to create economy is that it empowers individuals as economic actors. The importance of this principle is reinforced by key 21st century trends, the rise of the knowledge economy, the economic importance of innovation, the state's need for more creative entrepreneurial citizens, the growing appetite of people for what the largest survey of world values calls self-expression. Now, of course, enhancing freedom is the primary virtue of capitalism, particular cons particularly consumer capitalism. From meeting basic needs to providing the cornucopia of the modern marketplace, today's citizens in the developed, fast-developing world have access to goods and services and to choices that would have amazed their grandparents. And economic growth also allows the expansion of the state and its collective provisions. Yet even where the criteria for conventional economic success are their most compelling in relation to consumer choice, there are ways that our policy is failing to empower people. Concentrations of economic power can curtail, concentrations of economic power can curtail individual enterprise and collective choice. 
So there's a strong case for a more robust competition regime, one that targets excessive market dominance in areas like energy, banking, mobile communication. And a new challenge, not unrelated to the power of dominant global online platforms, concerns our freedom to decide how the ever-growing store of online data about our choices and characteristics is used and who benefits from it. The RSA is developing a project on the fast-growing and dynamic sharing economy, advocating an approach which acknowledges the empowering pro-social features of some, but by no means all, sharing platforms. But beyond consumption, it's in the sphere of wider human development, and particularly in relation to people with lower incomes and fewer assets, that the failure to meet the design specification of enhancing economic agency is most glaring. What could we do about it? Well, we might, for example, favour citizens, a citizen's basic income, an idea which the RSA intends to explore in more detail in the autumn. There are many variants of the core idea, which is, in essence, all citizens, with the exception of the wealthy, get a modest minimum living allowance. Grounded in a commitment to autonomy and dignity, the principle is that in a relatively affluent society, we should collectively provide the basic means for all citizens to make life choices. But there are other more pragmatic virtues to the policy. It might seem at first glance to damage work incentives, but practical experiments have shown the reverse. By reducing both means testing and incentives to cheat the system, a citizen income could rein back the ever more oppressive apparatus of state surveillance and punishment associated with welfare provision. Many commentators recognise that problems of low pay and low productivity in the UK economy are related to imbalances of power between employers and employees. By enabling people greater freedom to make choices over their lives, to prioritise learning or caring over unrewarding work, citizen income might contribute to addressing this imbalance. And this is a policy, too, that has had a variety of champions, from John Stuart Mill and Bertrand Russell to Frederick Hyatt, Milton Friedman and Paul Krugman. And whilst it sounds like it flies in the face of modern attitudes towards welfare, versions of basic income have been tried out largely successfully in many places. One is now policy in Norway, and another is subject to a forthcoming referendum in Switzerland. Alongside a minimum income, there are other ways we could give greater autonomy and economic opportunity directly to individuals. Take the poor level of adult skills in the, US, in the, in the UK. The reason for this failure is arguably that instead of a policy being based on a commitment to human development as an inherent design feature of a strong welfare economy, it's been narrowly instrumental and market-oriented, constantly tinkering to overcome the glaring mismatch between national economic goals, individual learner motivations, and employers' willingness to invest. Most experts, including most recent skills ministers, agree that the answer lies in giving power to the people through some form of individual learning account. Yet, because this idea failed for very specific reasons in the past, it's been sidelined. The RSA will soon be proposing a new model of learning accounts. And in the face of rising wealth inequality and the evidence of the impact on behaviour and aspiration of access to even very small assets, it's surely time to look again at an idea like the Children's Trust Fund, which guaranteed all children a small inheritance on reaching adulthood and provided incentives for poorer families to save. A final design principle for the power to create economy turns from individuals to wider society and calls for existing and newly created economic institutions to have a democratic participative dimension. The power to create economy is not one of servants and consumers, but of citizens. And again, this principle, the principle of public engagement, is borrowed from good design practice. Authentic public participation can mobilize collective intelligence, foster responsibility and trust, Crucially, it can give policymakers the space they need to act for the long term. In designing economic participation, we could start with the firm. The combination of short-term shareholder maximisation, the often empty vessel of PLC stewardship, the erosion of trade union power, means that the British are now amongst the most powerless and voiceless workers in the developed world. The consequences of this powerlessness can be seen in, a low, in low productivity, and in the high numbers of workers who report little or no scope for autonomy or self-development at work. There are many ways to give employees a greater say. They range from the radically decentralised models, described here at the RSA by the organisational theorist Frederick Laloux, to the more formal models of worker representation found in Germany and other countries. And at a national level, one doesn't have to be in favour of 1970s-style corporatism to wonder why the UK is so unusual in the complete absence of effective government-backed economic bodies bringing together the voice of employers, employees, and wider civil society. Among other issues, such bodies might advise on the need for new financial institutions, on ways to channel investment to enterprise and innovation, 
to make it easier to use our collective savings to invest in social and environmental goods. One of the key questions facing all economies is how they adapt to the massive impact of the next generation of technological change. And as economist Mariana Mazzucato has shown, public investment in higher education, R&D and procurement plays a huge role in industrial innovation. Our taxes play a huge role in industrial innovation, so shouldn't we have greater public deliberation about where and to what purpose we want to see such innovation directed? Indeed, as my colleague Anthony Painter has argued, the capacity to develop new, more participative economic institutions is an important but generally underplayed aspect of innovation. We can learn here from new economic models being developed in cities from Copenhagen to Cleveland, from Boulder to Bristol. Now, there is little prospect of many of the ideas I floated in this speech featuring in mainstream political debate any time soon. One reason, I suspect, is that many of them just seem too difficult. As EU President Jean-Claude Juncker said, I think I pronounced that right, did I? Uh, has said of his fellow politicians, we all know what to do, we just don't know how to get re-elected after we do it. <laughs> in this sense, one of the greatest problems standing in the way of building an economy that serves society may be us, our conservatism, our impatience, our cynicism. Being focused on impact at the RSA, we tend to think a policy idea is only as good as the model of public engagement that accompanies it, which is why my final proposal, one which I'd like the RSA itself to take forward, is to create a Citizens Economic Council. This would be a body of around 30 representative but independent people. Its members would be drawn from businesses, large, medium, small, social, from civil society, the third sector, from employee and professional organisations, from local and central government. Working in the open so anyone could watch its deliberations and input to its debates, the task of the Council over a two-year period would be to explore the deeper strengths and frailties of our economy, to develop core design principles for a resilient human welfare economy, and to assess a set of ideas which might help to create that economy by 2030. The aim would be for the Council's conclusions to be published sufficiently far in advance of the next general election to influence the debate, maybe even some of the policies being placed before the electorate. Tomorrow, George Osborne will unveil a set of new economic policies. Some of these policies are to be welcomed, particularly the next steps towards greater city devolution. The Chancellor's political job is to keep his party, the voters, and the City of London happy, and by that measure, he's doing a pretty good job. The task of the RSA today is, as it has always been, to ask bigger questions, to engage our fellows and the wider world in exploring new possibilities and experimenting with new approaches. I'm sure that my list of design principles is neither perfect nor exhaustive. My aim tonight has been to provide a framework for our research, not, research, not to predetermine its outcome. Nevertheless, I believe that principles such as these can enable us to take a broader, more ambitious view of economic debate, and maybe too, to make it easier for non-economists like me to join in that debate. Thank you. Matthew, thank you. That was fascinating. I'm going to um, kick things off before we turn to the audience for comments and questions. This is the frightening bit. <laughs> I I'd like to start by pushing you a little bit on the point you ended on, which is your theory of change and whether or not we can get to a power to create economy by urging the national government or political parties to adopt different economic policies because it sounded like even your Citizens Economic Council is going to propose policies. But in a complicated world where global matters and local matters, what's, how is this going to happen? Yeah, so um, I think it's a great question. And I think, um, look, you, you, you have to have policies. And if you're going to have policies, they should be good policies, not bad policies. Uh, but I have written um, about what I call the policy presumption, which is the view that the best way to change the world is a kind of top-down technocratic policy-making model. I think that there is no point trying to achieve major reform unless you win public support and engagement in that. Um, and so what we have to do, this is the problem, I think, this is why I've tried to connect in my speech the question of opening up economic debate with the possibility of radical reform. Because I think it's only when people 
uh, feel that they can engage in economic issues and they feel economic issues are not just about the next GDP figures or just about their own personal finances, uh, that you can start to create an environment in which it's possible to start imagining doing things differently. And think, you know, we created the welfare state in this country. We are capable of big ideas. We're capable of doing big things. And actually, as this government has shown, we're capable of taking pain if we feel that pain is necessary uh, to get the economy back on its feet. So the model of change is that we need to create an environment where more people feel that they can talk about economic issues, that it's not a kind of secret garden. Uh, and through that, get ideas. And I, what I found fascinating doing my research was that some of these ideas, that if you mention them to a kind of conventional policymaker, they just laugh at you. You've got incredibly thoughtful supporters from the right and the left. So the speech is all about how do we create a climate of opinion in which uh, big policy can be considered, because those kinds of policies will only work if we are signed up to them, if we are glad participants in making them work. I mean, individual learning accounts is a classic example of a policy. It's a good policy idea which failed because people didn't really understand it except fraudsters. So, uh, you know, we've got to have a kind of... Uh, we have to uh, 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 an engagement in policy which where we feel, and we understand that we're part of making that policy work. The other thing that struck me listening to you was um, actually how political some of this is, and I think it's revealed by some of the language. If you're talking about empowering people, what you're really talking about is actually the location of power in the economy. You discussed it in terms of competition policy, but it, isn't it actually about political power and who controls aspects of our lives? Yeah, I think it is, but I think, I suppose one of the things I'm trying to do in the speech is to break out of that kind of debate that we had a few months ago, um, that traditional kind of right of centre, left of centre debate, uh, and to argue that, um, that what we should be aiming for is not, as it were, to meet the needs of poorer people in a kind of paternalistic way, and I think there are all sorts of issues and problems with that kind of model but to provide everybody with the opportunities to be, as I say, a, 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 an economic actor uh, in their own right. And I think that, that politically, that is an idea that people find harder to resist. They can have all sorts of critiques of kind of the big state and models of dependency and uniformity and paternalism. But when you say, well, shouldn't everybody have the opportunity at some point in their life to create their own business? Uh, shouldn't everyone have the opportunity to um, learn throughout life? Uh, these ideas of individuals taking responsibility for creating their own opportunities, I think, drawing a broader constituency. As for the question of kind of collective power, I just think we're kind of hung up on what happened in the 70s. I think we've got a kind of, and it's amazing how people talk about amnesia, but we've got the reverse, really. It's kind of because of the winter of discontent, we've kind of thrown out the entire idea that it's possible for employers and employees to have intelligent conversations together and to be partners in... No other country has this hang-up. Nobody else thinks that to engage social partners in a debate about the future of the economy and where we should industrial strategy and these things, that this is a kind of throwback to the 1970s. Only we have this hang-up. And I think we just need to kind of let go of it. We have a lot of uniquely British hang-ups, I think. Um, I might come back for more, <laughs> but I'm now going to turn to the audience. And I need to... Um, there's a microphone around, so please wait for the microphone. Uh, tell us who you are, if it's relevant. And uh, use the mic, because it's all being recorded for uh, people online and uh, downloading the podcast. And finally, um, please keep your questions or comments as, as brief as you can, as a courtesy to everybody else who wants to get in. So, um, depending on how many hands go up, I might take these in batches. First one is right back there. Anybody else want to put their hand up? And another one down here, thank you. And then the third one over there. I'll keep the people with the mics running around. <laughs> Sir. <coughs> thank you. I'm Russell Woodrow, a fellow. Um, <coughs> it seems to become very much ingrained in our society that uh, people on benefits are losers. Um, <coughs> that's, it's going to be quite a um, tall order to turn the nation's thinking around, I would have thought. Uh, to convince them that losers are actually potential winners. You've given some indications about how that might be done, but it is a very tall order, and how on earth would you begin to progress from here? Shall I answer Do you want to take them one by one? Um, I, look, I, I, uh, well, I've, I've sent my speech to a number of people, and the one issue that people keep coming back to me on is the citizen basic income, because it, it has a kind of pushing water uphill feeling to it, the idea that you would 
in the current climate that say that everybody would be able to get... I mean, we're talking about we'll be advocate, when we advocate this in the autumn, we're talking about a very modest sum, you know, equivalent to unemployment benefits, so not a sum of money that you would be able to have a great life on. But I think that when you, the more you look at the policy, the more that you see... I mean, the, where it's been experimented with, it does actually, for many people, improve work incentives because it reduces the effect of means testing. And uh, one of the main times it was tried out in the States, the only group of people who were less likely to work as a consequence of this, um, were young mothers who chose to spend a bit more time at home bringing up their children, which many people, I think, whether it should be mothers or fathers, that that's not necessarily a bad, necessarily a bad thing. And I do think also another thing that has changed this debate is, what's, is our low productivity and the sense that it, what good does it do the economy to be forcing hundreds of thousands of people into jobs of very limited value where they earn very little more than they would on benefits. And that is part of our productivity puzzle. So if a universal citizen's income did give people a little bit more opportunity to say, I won't take that job which doesn't seem to have any capacity for me to grow and develop and doesn't seem to do much good, then I, I'm not sure, as I say, I know it is counterintuitive, but I think that actually could have good uh, economic effects. But you're quite right. We need to do something. And I, I wonder sometimes where this hostility to the very idea of welfare, when, when, when does it end, really? We now have hundreds of thousands of people having their benefits taken off them by fiat now because they don't turn up for interviews and things like that. We're going to have £12 billion pounds more cuts. There's all sorts of problems about the benefit system. So one of the reasons I advocate this policy is we need actually a completely different mindset in how we approach this. The next question is over here. Thank you. My name is Kevin Sefton. Um, you talked about citizens as glad participants um, in the, the human welfare economy. And I'm interested to what extent the changes that you're advocating are about policy and to what extent we need to actually change as society in order to make us more glad participants, um, given the delight that the media and others take in any demise of any policy um, and the way that people tend to set out to, to actually cause it to fail. Yeah, that's why I made the point I made earlier, which is that I think a lot of policy well, is bound to fail unless it has a strategy for civic engagement you know, built into it. Um, but policymakers tend to think that what changes the world is policy and that you should add on public engagement as an extra. I go the other way. I'd say what changes the world is public engagement, and sometimes policy can play a part in that. Um, so... Uh, I, 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 and I think a lot of countries have tried hard in all sorts of quite interesting ways to engage the public in more richly in a kind of strategic debate. I mean, a whole number of countries have done this and with varying degrees of success, but they've kind of said we do need a richer public conversation about this. And I also, I think, I think that we, we, we've kind of, the idea that economy and democracy go together as ideas has become odd for us, and I, I don't think it should be odd. Why should, and why should we not have a greater sense of democracy around our economic activities? And uh, as I've said... Um, autonomy, the, 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 I think that giving people a stronger sense of autonomy in the workplace is a really important thing and that's something that could come out of better forms of engagement. It is telling that lots of evidence demonstrates that the biggest cause of uh, illness at work is people feeling they have no autonomy, they have no capacity for self-expression. Uh, so a lot of people, are they, their lives, their working lives say to them the economic sphere is not a sphere where you uh, you know, we're, we're interested in your voice. We're interested in who you are. You know, it's a place where you just do something in order to get money to be able to spend it at the end of the week. So I think there's a kind of broader need for us to understand that the economy is a sphere for human agency, which is not how it feels for millions of people. The third one was um, over here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Esri Karlebach, fellow and former staff member. Um, Matthew, do we need a better metaphor for our abilities as a species than human capital? Um, and if so, do you have a suggestion? Because after all, as you were saying, we tend to have very narrow nar narratives that frame these discussions. Um, perhaps changing that metaphor might help. I don't know, really. Um, I think we do have a tendency, don't we, to kind of try to economise terms to give them legitimacy. Social capital, human capital. Capital, yeah, cultural capital. You know, well, that's got a different history. But uh, yes, I don't know. I think uh, obviously human capital is completely different to other forms of capital, like kind of equipment and finance and stuff like that. But I suppose the point of the idea is to, is to get across the notion that 
I mean, I think until you know, if you go about 20 years, it, it really wasn't accepted as a concept at all. And I think there's a lot of work. We did some work a while ago about how it is you get firms to... It is still the case that, that, that when companies are valued, their staff are valued as a, as a cost rather than as an asset. And there isn't really... There's been a lot of attempts. I don't know. You'll know more about it than I do, probably, perhaps, Diane. But there have been various attempts to get companies to really measure what their, what their staff are worth because that then incentivizes investing... Uh, in them and developing them. So I, I think it'll do as a concept, I'd say. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> I'll take some more questions. Uh, prefacing that by saying that I am an equal opportunity taker of questions, so without wanting to pressure any of the women in the audience, please do ask questions too. And somebody right here has put her hand up. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Sue Nosley, fellow. Um, I was just going to ask about... Uh, the, uh, your, your notion of a land tax and how you envisage that might affect um, organisations like the National Trust that manage our, our valuable open spaces and provide our well-being without being sort of like financially productive or the Royal Parks who um, are under a lot of pressure to have events and build on their um, green spaces in order to um, pay for their existence. Uh I wouldn't claim to be an expert on land tax, and there are some people whose expertise on land tax is kind of terrifying. And if there are anybody in here, any in the room, they'll tell you in great detail the answer to that question. Um, uh, I, I think that almost certainly the answer is if the land is being used for a so, in, if the land is being used for a socially benign, uh, for a social purpose, then it, um, I would imagine it would be exempt in such a system. What we're talking about is land that is not being used for any purpose at all. And as we know, one of the issues, I'm not saying it's the only issue, and sometimes it's exaggerated, but one of the issues around housing supply is land banking. People have got land and they're not using it. And you know, one of the remarkable things about land, I heard the statistic the other day, I can't remember, an unbelievable statistic about what, how the value of farmland changes when it gets planning permission. You know, it's kind of to the order of a thousand to one or something. I mean, yeah, it's complete, maybe. and that is totally a win for gain. Now, I'm not objecting to people who've got land benefiting from the fact they've got land, but when planning permission increases the value of something by a thousand fold, and none of the benefit of that is reaped by, you know, uh, by the, by by society as a whole, then I think you know there's a, there's a problem there. So. I have to admit, many of the things I advocated in my speech tonight are things that the RSA is working on is going to advocate. Land tax is one I can plump for myself. I, you know, in the end, I'm not sure whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but I think the point I'd want to make is that the reason people don't talk about it is because they just think it's too difficult. They, they remember the poll tax, and they think any tax that's got winners and losers, the losers keep quiet and the winners are on the streets. And that's why they rule it out. Not because actually it won't work, that these kind of issues that you raise can't be dealt with, but just because it's too politically difficult. And I think it's a really big problem. And that, you know, our tax system is very far detached from any kind of principles-based approach. It's higgledy-piggledy being brought together by, you know, people, you know, by wanting to win votes, by responding to a particular problem. You know, and I'm, I don't know what George Orson will do tomorrow, but he probably won't make it any simpler. All chances promise to make it simpler, but they don't really succeed. It's very hard. Simplifying is the hardest thing. Yeah. But there's no kind of, there's no basis even upon which you might simplify. There's no kind of set of principles that you might uh, apply to it. So I think uh, the, the point I'm wanting to make about land tax is that if we did say, how well, do tax, how well does our tax system tax bad things and not tax good things, then that kind of idea would, 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 would be on the table. And it's not even on the table at the moment. There are pros and cons of any tax, including land value tax, but there are also some very interesting examples of it being used in the US to, um, in particular towns or cities, to get brownfield sites back, in, back into use, and that's a very attractive option. And it also, I mean, one of the things about it is it's, it, it, it can encourage infra infrastructure investment because you can reap the benefits of that infrastructure investment because people's land value rises and, uh, and, and you get some of that back to the exchequer. So it, 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 it's a way of financing infrastructure. Another question, yes. Gentleman here, and then in the back. Hello. Paul Palmarosa, fellow. Uh, Matthew, I just wondered if you might speak about the learning and development activities of the RSA, um, helping to imbue in schools, and the ac academies program, young people with these finer qualities in life, so that as they grow up, they're able to be a more creative um, contribution to the society, that larger picture that you mentioned, the larger life. How is that being implemented? 
Um, well, we have a family of academies, and we're working really hard with them to explore how they can help young people to feel confident to be creative, because we think that is a core competency for the 21st century, and we think it's a core competency which is both an economic competency but something which makes life good. Um, I was in this room two hours ago uh, for the second RSA, RSA Academy's Arts Day, which was, so we had children from all those schools and they were doing a performance that they put together today. It was absolutely, it was so much more exciting than me. Um, <laughs> and I told them that. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's important. And I think that, you know, the debate, um, I, you know, I don't want to be kind of political, but I, I thought the decision last week by the government to make EBAC compulsory was one of the most stupid policy ideas I've ever heard in my entire life, I have to say. I mean, the idea that forcing young people to do that set of subjects, which will have an effect on... I mean, it will mean that young people who should be concentrating on maths and English and should be developing vocational skills will be forced to kind of study modern languages and geography and history, even if they've got no aptitude, no enthusiasm for it. It will make it incredibly hard for schools to do arts and things like that because of the pressure on them to get you back. And now, of course, even if you're a good school, you can have your head, throat sacked. You know, you, it's not, you know, you have to be outstanding. Every school has to be outstanding, which is kind of a ridiculous idea because how can every school be outstanding? I mean, so we're kind of pushing against the tide. I think my point I'm trying to make in the speech is that this debate about human assets is that that education debate is very much connected to that we, we've got a speaker coming here quite soon I think in his book I can't remember this title it's basically China has got the best and the worst schools in the world because it's got the best schools if what you think matters is a particular type of learning but the Chinese themselves would say it's got some of the least good schools if what you need is creativity uh, um, and kind of uh, enterprise and innovation and those kinds of things so this is a live debate uh, the particular thing we're hoping to do is to find ways of assessing creativity. One of the problems is that it's easy to assess all the other things, but it's quite hard to assess whether or not you've been successful in enabling young people to feel that sense of creativity. So we're, we're exploring how, how you might do that. Um, let me just get a sense of how many other people want to make a comment or ask a question. Just all stick your hand up. Great, three more. Fine. Um, so Formal. it was at the back first, and then we'll come over here after that. So Tom Jeffrey, I'm news editor at the News Hub. I just wanted to uh, take you up on your point about uh, for a human welfare economy to happen, you need a public conversation. Uh, you can't just impose it from high. Um, given that, as you said, uh, a lot of people experience the state as um, a place where they're surveilled and often disciplined um, the workplace in a similar way. Um, I'm just wondering where that public conversation happens and what you think a worthy partner would be uh, to engage with uh, to make that conversation happen. Well, I guess I've suggested the RSA might, be, might have the right mixture of radicalism and history, and we've got Royal in our name. We, we, we combine. We're kind of both risky and safe at the same time in a kind of intriguing way. Um, uh, the one thing I would say that I think is positive because it, it, is it, I do think that what's going on in the cities is much more interesting than what's going on nationally, and I think that that's you know I think George Osborne is to be entirely commended for his commitment to decentralising power to cities, and there'll be more on that tomorrow. I think that's a really big shift. I think when people look back on this government, whatever they say about it, they will say this was a government that finally recognised that the, the centralisation of the English state in particular, although Scotland's pretty centralised within Scotland as well, that that needed to end. And I think that's a really really big achievement actually. Um, although there's a lot of detail to be gone through, but it's, it's so it's about city, but it's also if you look around, I mentioned a few cities in America. There's some really interesting experiments in different ways of running economies and doing things coming from a community up. So there was in America there was a after the credit crunch there was a real explosion of these kinds of alternative economic experiments. You know in Bristol they've got their own pound. George Ferguson, the uh, Bristol mayor, was telling me that he's paid in Bristol pounds. So I hope he's found a shop where he can buy red trousers in Bristol. But um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I think there's interesting experiment. So part, I think part of the model of change, actually, is looking at some of these things that are working at a sub-national sub level and saying, well, actually, how can we create the freedom for, for more of that kind of innovation to take place? Um, who was over here? Yes. Okay. Microphone over here. Thank you. Um, how do you make the sort of man or woman on the street um, vote or think in terms of these kind of policy ideas or, or this kind of, these kind of ideas rather than just personalities or uh, 
other things that, that you haven't talked about in your speech? So I think it, it, you've got to be realistic about this. Most people are most concerned about everyday issues and uh, they're not particularly interested in politics and they're never going to be particularly interested in politics. But what people respond to is what they read from experts and from the kind of general public discourse. Uh, and I think that what I tried to say early on in my speech is that I think public discourse about economy has been very impoverished over many years. I think that partly for the reasons, that the contingent reasons of economic growth followed by um, uh, the credit crunch. So I think that I'm not, I'm not suggesting, I'd love, you know, I love the idea of the average man and woman at the bus stop, you know, chatting away about citizens' incomes and individual learning accounts, but I think the point is, People are able to take a broader view of the economy if they're encouraged to believe that they have the capacity, they can do that. But I think they've been discouraged from that. I think people have been discouraged from the idea that anybody can talk about the economy apart from special people called economists who use rather complicated terms and formulae. Um, and I also think that the discourse has been dominated by a particular interpretation of a particular school of economics, which fortunately now has been largely discredited. And it was actually, I sent an early version of the speech to Dan, and one of the things I took out was I kind of had a big attack on economics and Diane reminded me that, that uh, this is a bit out of date, really, and that the most interesting brands are. Although I think, as, as we discussed, that that version of economics is still very dominant in political discourse and the policy world. Yeah, yeah. it still appears in kind of newspaper columns, but yeah. even though economists have long since, you know, it's been referred to as zombie, zombie economics. It lives on, despite the fact that very few people who kind of think about these things adhere to it. So I'm not unrealistic, but I think if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the media discourse about economy was broader and more open and more inviting, and the conversations that people saw people having on TV and all that was taking place, they themselves, in different ways at different times, would start to relate to the economy. But at the moment, I think they just think it's something very complicated. The only way I can interpret it is, my, is the money in my pocket. Although what's encouraging is that there's a lot of interest in this subject. And I go and talk about GDP. How boring is that? And an audience this size will turn up to listen Your to it. Your book wasn't boring, Diane. Your book was very good. Um, uh, last few questions. Yes, uh, there. There's one over here, yeah? And then one right over here. So if the people with the microphones can sprint to each extreme of the room, thank you. Shall I take these last two together to take finish together. the game? And then we're going to run out of time. Start. So go ahead. Uh, hi, my name's um, Ali Raza Akhtar Hamdani. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Just generally what I was going to say is this. We look at um, the old type of um, what we would call the UK or Britain. Where is the shipbuilding? You know, the steelworks in Sheffield, does that exist? And even if we look at an example of welfare, is it welfare as an example? And I will say this, China, believe me, they've been saving a lot of money and whoever is an ally with China is very, very smart. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> and over here, thanks. Uh, ben Bennett's yet another fellow. Um, I just want to come back to the first question that was asked about uh, benefits claimants and how we reverse the perception of them as losers, which is uh, fairly widespread. I spent four months last year on Job Seekers Allowance. Uh, for me personally, it was the most developmental and creative time, um, well, one of the most developmental and creative times of my life. There is absolutely no way that anyone can measure that other than me. Where do I put it? <clears throat> well, I, I, won't, um, I won't respond to the point, about the, the, the point about China. That is well beyond my uh, brief. But uh, I, I think it's just worth saying that actually, and Diane can confirm this, I, I'm sure, that although there's a, a lot fewer manufacturing jobs in Britain, actually, you know, where we do do manufacturing, we do it rather well. I was in Warwick, Warwick today. And, stuff that Warwick University is doing with Land Rover and Jaguar is amazing. So we, we do have strengths in those areas. And, um, but on this point about uh, welfare, I mean, the problem is that every 30 years since the spinning Jenny or whatever, people have said, we're going to run out of work. And they've always been wrong. And now they're saying it again. And the problem is one day they'll be right. And I wonder whether this next set of technology is going to be the technology that finally does what people have always said over and over and over again, which is there comes a point when we don't need, we're not going to need as much human labour as we have needed in the past. Oh, I very much disagree with you about that. Have you I got time to disagree? Of course you have. Of course you have. <laughs> um, I think they'll be wrong again because we redefine what we mean by work. And um, there, it, people are infinitely creative. All kinds of uh, jobs and services come along that it turns out are, are creative work and can be sold in the market for income. But the problem is the, is the transition. Mm. We've had this kind of transition before. We had it in the early 1980s with the deindustrialization 
And it was a really big switch in the kinds and numbers of jobs that were available in different places. And we handled that terribly. This time around, it'll be a bit faster and a bit bigger, maybe, but on that kind of scale. So what we really need to do is focus on those individuals whose jobs go and what happens to them. See, now what people will say when they go home is they'll say, well, he did, he did all right, but then Di made this fantastic point at the end. If I, <laughs> if I, why, why didn't she do the lecture? And then he could have asked the questions, and then we'd all have learned so much more. But anyway, thank you. No. But, uh, can, I, can I also add one final question, Matthew, before you yes. get led off? This has covered a really wide range of topics, and a lot of them are very detailed, and you're going to do work mm. on these different elements of it. How do we keep ourselves... Um, uh, how do we unify it? How do we think about the project as a whole? Well, you're very kind to ask that question because it enables me to go back to my uh, um, moment in, uh, near Pisa. I, I do... Look, I, the, the, the design principles that I have outlined tonight, I'm sure they're not right, but I, I think the idea of design principles is a really interesting one. I think the idea that we have a debate about what should be the guiding principles for a way in which we think about our economy it's much richer. I think when we talk about individual policies, it becomes very technocratic. I don't think people understand it. I think we can have interesting conversations about ultimate destinations, as you did in your GDP book, but I think it becomes a bit abstract. I think this question of what, what is the nature of the economy that we want and what would be the kind of principles, and then we can start to improve kind of accountability because we can start to say, look, if this is the principle, if the principle is that we should value human assets in this particular way, or the principle is that one of our chief, we were talking, you and I, before about, you know, the BBC, you know, had we kind of said the BBC is a major British asset, we might not be pulling it apart in the way that we are, but, you know, we haven't made that decision, and so we're doing what we're doing. So I think what I'm trying to say here is by having a conversation about principles, establishing uh, those principles in people's minds, we can demand of policymakers and of our debate a certain, a greater consistency, a, a greater clarity uh, over time. So whilst I am sure that in a year or two years' time, if the RSA won't be promulgating the same principles that I've outlined this evening, I do hope actually that idea of a set of design principles and the notion that designers bring, which is to combine values, that kind of sense of where you want to get to, with a set of principles which are flexible, which are flexible but, but are strong, and which guide you in that process of change. I, I think that is, I hope that that is a useful idea. Well, I think that idea of accountability to uh, delivering on our values is a really useful one and a great note on which to end. So I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you all very much for coming along and taking part in the conversation. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, if I missed anybody there, but there'll be a chance to continue downstairs because um, you're all invited to stay on for drinks there. Um, and people will show you the way. But can I just ask you to uh, thank Matthew for a fascinating, wide-ranging, and actually very inspiring speech this evening. Thank you. Thank you.